Hello and welcome back to the Russian Football News Podcast. While we record, Siska are currently playing Dinamo Zagreb in Moscow right now and it's nil-nil at half-time. But we've got three Champions League games to cover and a quick look back at the weekend's RPL action. Joining me with this week once again, first off, is Richard Pike. Good evening, everybody. How are we all? I'm not too bad, not too bad, mate, at all, because we've got the return of David Sanson. Always good to be here, and I'm glad you're happy to have me. Now, Loco hosted the current UCL reigning champions, Bayern, in, in Moscow on Tuesday night. Marco Nikolic lined up a side in a, what was a Christmas tree formation almost, of Zilouish up front, clearly looking to stifle their opponents all night. While Bayern dominated the early proceedings, Loco more than held their own. Leon Goretzka fired the away side into an early 1-0 lead, and many of us feared the worst from there on. However, the floodgates remained firmly shut, as Murillo, Murillo in particular did a fine job of keeping Robert Lewandowski as quiet as possible. The game continued in the same trend for large swathes. Loco would surrender possession and territory, and looked back to break beyond Bayern's increasingly high defensive line. But they went into the break just a goal down. For the second half, Vedran Chiluga was withdrawn due to injury and replaced by summer signing Slobodan Rajkovic. And the second half continued basically as the first ended, with Bayern dominating possession once again. But considering the quality of their opponents, Loco were often quite untroubled at the back. They grew more into the game and really threatened on the counter. But their final ball just let them down as Bayern did look a little bit ropey from those counter-attacks at times. The threat came down from the right again and again as Vladislav Ignatiev and Dmitry Zhivogliadov looked to get forward whenever they were able. And Anton Moranchuk equalised the 20 remaining after a good interchange of play down that right-hand side again, just before Zilowish fed the young Russian. However, just 10 minutes later, Joshua Kimmich picked up the ball in the edge of the box and let fly in at the far corner in a rare milk moment of space, as Loco's midfield just couldn't close the space down quick enough. The game ended 2-1, and Loco went toe-to-toe with Bayern in a very respectable performance. If perhaps some quicker players like Vitaly Lasakovic and maybe Rifa Jemalatinov were introduced earlier, they could maybe have even caused havoc in the huge gaps behind David Alaba and Javi Martinez. But Loco in the end lost all three points, but gained a lot of respect on the night. So, Richard, who impressed for you for Loco? I think most of the um, defensive unit um, did the bit I thought. Um, in general, the, the centre-back duo. Um, and then surprisingly, Rajkovic, when he came on, you know, um, we were fearing the worst when uh, Choluka went off at half time. But um, I think Slobodan Rajkovic, you know, he, he came on and um, looked very solid in defence for them, surprisingly. Um, I thought as well, you know, Gregor, Kliho- Gregor uh, Klichoviak had a decent game for them in midfield. Um, and although, you know, there was that frustrating moment at 1 1 where he should have he should have squared the pass across goal to uh, Jamal Etninov. You know, Zelovich is running to down that left, um, down that channel, um, and then when he set up um, Anton Moranchuk for the goal, was was good as well. Um, and then obviously, yeah, Moranchuk and Antoshka himself. You know, it was a lovely taken goal. You know, nice comp- composed finish um, from a good run, and he lost his man in the box and uh, finished well. And um, you know, it was it was a tough and challenging week for the um, for the RPL teams in Europe this week. Um, but I thought Loco were the real bright spot. Um, you know, that was that was one of Bayern Munich's toughest games all season. You know, considering they've been running up eight nil score lines against Schalke, five nil against Frankfurt, um, and and it can you know one of the toughest examinations this season came from a side who nobody gave a prayer to pre the game. You know, we were all expecting well, well, fearing the worst for Locomotive pre game. So, you know, I came away from that game, you know, especially in the second half with a real sense of, of happiness, you know, that locomotive are proving us wrong in Europe this season, despite, you know, this 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 uh, defeat. Um, took a wonder goal by Kimmich to beat them. Um, now, the key now is to just, you know, build on it against Atletico at home next week. They've got to try and take advantage of that game. Um, and I just hope I just hope it's it's not a false dawn now. You know, I hope locomotive can keep up this level of performance. You know, um, we don't expect them to go through, but Obviously, you know, um, but you know, hopefully they can keep up this level of performance and possibly now have a chance to get in third place in the group. I still think they'll finish bottom, but maybe they might have a chance of third place now. Just got to keep the momentum going. But um, 
but yeah, um, fingers crossed. Some some good hope there, I think. Yeah, certainly there is hope, and it's it's very much a case of Loco playing with the shackles off of them enjoying their football. They're clearly thriving in this this uh, pressure cooker environment. And Hanu, who was who runs our Twitter now and does a brilliant job of it, figured realised that uh, in the Champions League, Russian clubs have only won three of the last eighteen games. They're just clearly outclassed and outmatched. But to be credit to Loco and Nikolic in particular, the way that Nikolic lines his team up, this very defensive, rigid formation, breaking on the counter-attack, is actually quite well suited for for playing these bigger teams in the Champions League. And and you can really see that they are stepping up to the occasion as well. And in, in talking about stepping up a little bit too high, we often see Bayern playing this very high line and and what they do is, is basically they they pin your opponents, the opponents back so far that, that you you just can't get out of your own area and you, and you seem to be stuck there. But it can sometimes be a little bit of an Achilles heel. I mean, it's a very small one. Look, they're a brilliant football team, of course. I'll have to preface that. But the space in behind to get to get at them. And David, is it fair to say that Loco spurned some great chances in the counter, or perhaps even get a draw? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was strange to see it happen over and over again in the second half um, by letting Loco um, exploit that space. Um, you, you'd expect a team like that, uh, of that class, to, to learn and you know try and stop that from happening. But um, Zeloish was getting away a good amount of times, especially. Um, and then you had Moranchuk and Smolov break, breaking uh, behind him. Um there was a number of times where they had where they got the ball out of the defence. They were in the midfield looking for the final ball, um, and Bayern were just too quick to close them down. But they were like, if the player, if, if like Krakowiak or whoever it was in the midfield had managed to make the right turn and get just a yard of space, they'd have had a good ball on to to get someone away. Uh, obviously, it did pay off in the end. Uh, Giroud Gliadov got um, Zeloish away down the right, and uh, they got the goal. Um, and then after the goal, they had two golden chances from Zer- well, I can't, the Zer- Zer- one might have been before the first goal, actually. And then Anton Miranchuk had a good one afterwards. Not as not as good because the ball was bouncing and he just couldn't get the good it under control. It was sort of, I think it bounced and it just was too high for him to hit it first time. So he had to try and let it come down and just eventually the shot got blocked. Um, but Zeloish obviously had a great chance to square, to square on across, but, you know, dragged his shot. Um terribly wide instead. Um, so, yeah, there, there were certainly some some regrets because, you know, they did waste chances that they they had. Um, but, well, you know, all respect to them, you know, we all wrote Lokomotiv off before this season and, and he really did well yesterday. Uh, not yesterday. Oh, yeah, it was yesterday. No, it wasn't. Earlier this week, whenever. You know, that they, they really held their own. Uh, and it's nice to have had that happen for their last two Champions League games, you know. We, we all said, or well, we all jokingly or otherwise said we, we expected them to not get any points out of this um, and, they, and they could have come out or come away with two draws against um, their weakest and toughest opponent um, you know they, they've played much better than I than I expected granted you know Bayern in theory could have gone ahead two or three goals in the first half uh, but didn't take their chances that they had you know they're especially um, exploiting Rebus down the left um, but yeah yeah they did really well and you sort of do, you'd feel a little bit uh, grudged because, you know, Loco are really on the ascendancy. They were, they were getting away, it seemed like, every other minute sort of getting away. And then suddenly out of nowhere, Bayern picked the ball up and Kimmich smashes it into the into the corner from, from 25 yards. And it was just, that just popped, popped the balloon of, uh, of their uh, ascendancy that they had going on. Yeah, and it was particularly the side of half time where locals seemed to get into their own a little bit. There's two moments that I really, really remember quite vividly, and it was both involved Zeluish, who had very much what he was like at Spartak, where it's that Jekyll and Hyde performance. At times, he's battling up there with absolutely nobody near him for 60, 70 yards and getting his team up the pitch in a vital role. But at other times, when they are up the pitch and and the, the counter-attacking, there's so many attacks just fall flat at his feet. There was one when there was Ignatiev was completely free on the edge of the box. He just had to play him in and he would have been in behind completely free with men in as well. And he just 
cut in and play this ridiculously awful cross that flew flew out back back for a goal kick. And there was another situation when when um, Zilouis was holding on to the ball and Smolov was gone and he just hesitated far too much and just kept onto it. These are fine margins and it seems a little bit harsh to pick up on them because some of the other aspects of his performance was so impressive. But you have to do this against Bayern. If you're going to play a team like Bayern Munich, you can't let these chances go to waste. And it's crazy to say that Loco were probably feeling slightly aggrieved not to get a point out of the game against what is right now the best team in Europe. Now, one of the reasons for the performance was at the heart of defence. I was really impressed by Murillo, who, when, especially when Choluca went off at half time, he stepped up to the plate. He led the defence. He was the one who was leading them out. He was judging on the lines. He was getting the offside calls all right. And, and the rest all followed his step in. Now, Richard, what did, what did you think of Murillo's performance at centre back? Got to say that um, that 2.5 million euros that Lokomotiv paid to Cruzeiro in Brazil for Murillo is looking like money really well spent. Um, I thought last season when he arrived, he um, he showed glimpses, but obviously it was um, an adaptation period to uh, Russian football. You know, he was only very young. He was 20, I think he's 22 that last year, so he's 23 this year. So he was just adapting and getting used to a new league, new style. And obviously, you know, there was the change of coach as well last season from Schumann to Nikolic. But I think this season, um, guys, I think he's been really, really good for Lokomotiv. And, um, you know, um, he's come on leaps and bounds um, playing alongside Choluka this season. Um, I really feel he could be a player who um, who could, like Rodrigo Becau, who left, obviously, Siska for Udinese. I think he could be a player who, in the summer, might got... Um, might um, attract interest from um, clubs in Western Europe, in the in the big Western European five leagues. Um, and, you know, Loco could get a really big transfer fee for him, especially if he keeps up um, this performance. And yeah, I echo those thoughts about um, how he stepped up into uh, the leadership role at the back in the absence of um, Chorluka, because I was really fearing when that happened, you know, oh, I was really worried for them defensively in the second half of Lokomotiv, but um, Murillo had a very solid game all round. And yeah, he's... He's really stepped up his level of performance last year. There was real pro- this year, sorry, there was real promise last year, and this year he's just um, taken it to a whole new level. So yeah, very impressed with him so far. Yeah. So if we're going to move on to the other game that took place on, and the early kickoff this time on Wednesday night, as Krasnodar hosted the first big marquee game of the UCL, and which is pretty fair to say the the biggest match in their history so far, and hosting Chelsea in southern Russia. Much like Loco, the game was again largely spent in Krasnodar's half with the depleted sides often on the back foot. Chelsea themselves won an early penalty after another error from Caio, but Jorginho spot kick cannoned off the post and hit Matvey Safanov in the back of the sort of <laughs> solar plexus area, and he didn't really have a clue, but either way, it stayed out for the meantime and then dropped away to safety. Not long later, though, Chelsea did take a deserved lead. Callum hudson odoi raced in from the left wing and shot towards the Krasnodar goal. However, some disaster struck as... Safanov team that seemed to take his eye off and what was a quite straightforward shot and fumbled it into the net. Minutes later, he was almost caught out again and, and clearly was very nervous on such a big occasion. Now, they did, however, more than hold their own for the majority of the first half. And it was only really a few big mistakes that threatened the Bulls goal. The second half, however, was a little bit of a different story and especially late on. Krasnodar did have a few decent chances, especially on the counter-attack. And Christopher Olsen, I thought, impressed out of position again. But a dodgy penalty call, which we'll get into later, but it's pretty, pretty awful call and should have really been picked up by VAR. And then two late goals put a little bit of gloss on the tie for Chelsea. So first of all, David, what are your thoughts on that penalty incident? Uh, well, it, it wasn't a penalty. You know, uh, I feel like I've studied the handball rules a lot over the last six months, considering every dodgy decision or every not so dodgy decision that Russian fans are getting rolled up by. Uh, and I knew straight away that a ball that hits part of a player's body and then hits their arm afterwards uh, is not an offence. And that's what happened to Martinovic. It hit him in the midriff or on, on his upper thigh and bounced away and hit his arm, which was not even out from his body. Not that that matters anymore. You know, if it hits the arm, it hits the arm. Uh, but it hit his leg or his midriff first. Uh, and by the laws of the game, uh, that shouldn't have been a penalty. And it was, it was a shame because... Um, Krasnodar really for the most of the game I thought uh, I thought you're right there was a bit a bit unfair but I thought they were largely the better team um, 
you know, Chelsea had their chances and, and they capitalised on, on the mistakes. Um, but especially in the second half, Krasnodar, for the first 20 minutes of that second half, seemed to be controlling the ball. And it was actually the same in the first half. Uh, first 20 minutes of the first half, it was basically all Krasnodar uh, play without a great deal of chances, or they had a couple very early in the game. Um, but yeah, the penalty was was the killer blow. You know, after after the mistake by Safonov, you know, there was always hope that Krasnodar could get back in the game. They obviously they, they hit the bar, but um, the penalty was what really killed the tie off completely. Um, uh, it was just at a key point, and the second goal was just like it just put the tie out of reach, and the players knew it, and the fans knew it, uh, and the fact that it wasn't even a penalty was was just uh, um, what's the phrase. Just uh, well, just an extra blow. I can't remember the phrases that means that for some reason. Yeah, I agree. The penalty was just an absolute farce of a decision. Um, like you said, you meant you'd checked on, uh, double checked the the rules of the game and, and the the double hit where it comes off any part of your body and onto your arm. Then it's in the rule book as not a penalty, and I don't quite understand why VAR is even in if they can't pick up these sorts of things. But aside from the penalty, which really took the, the wind out of Krasnodar's sails. It was a moment to forget and a night to forget in general for, for Matvey Safanov. Now, David, you are a big Matvey Safanov fan, but he was pretty disastrous last night at fault for at least two of the goals. And I think he just really struggled mentally in the big time. Do you think these mistakes are a worrying trend, David, or not? Um, Yeah, it's, it's been it's been a while. See, we, we've said before about both him and Maximenko that you know they're both very good shot stoppers uh, with worrying consistency uh, this season I, I think we'd all sort of felt that Safonov had, had upped his consistency uh, and, and that's obviously was the opinion of, of the coaches and scouts because he, he beat Maximenko to the, to the national team um, but yeah I think you have to imagine it must have been something to do with nerves on the, on the big night there that got to him because it was, it's not the kind of mistake we've even seen him make before. Like just to fumble a save like that, I don't think. Um, you know, it was it was a pretty tame shot from Hudson Odoi, and, and he just let it slip through his arms. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was a shame. It was a shame to see, um, and you do think he he might have yeah been been nervous on that occasion. Uh, you know, it, it was a big occasion. You know, arguably one of the biggest games of his whole career. So, um, so yeah, it, it was it was disappointing. It was a dis- disappointing one, um, but we we have to you know he's very young still for you know goalkeepers technically don't aren't supposed to peak until their late twenties. He's he's twenty one years old, so uh, we can still hope that there's there's a big future for him and Maximenko in the national team, and and they'll both be uh, big players for Russia for years to come. Mm. Yeah, we're becoming to sound like a little bit of a broken record, constantly referencing these mistakes. But to be fair, this was Safanov's first for a while. And I, I do definitely agree that you don't see this sort of mistake from Safanov very often. A lot of them have been, because of his slight frame, his command of the area, quite a few. This this, this shot-stopping ability, 99% of the time, you would bet your house on him not making this sort of error. And I think it purely was just pressure of the game, of the, the historic sort of uh, significance that just got to him a little bit, got to his young shoulders. And he did look a little bit like a deer in headlights. That's well, that one way he made a mistake just after that, where a Chelsea player crossed the ball in and and um, the Kai Havertz knocked, knocked the head of goal, but he was offside. Safanov came for that and he was in no man's land. Like he was just, he completely misjudged the flight of the ball. And it came very, very soon after the mistake for the goal. And it just seemed like, that first mistake then had a knock-on effect for that again, and his confidence was just down for the rest of the game, and it was on the back of his mind. Uh, one would hope that he wouldn't become it wouldn't become a little bit of a monkey on his back, and I think he's better than that. I don't think it will whatsoever. I just think it was one of those games where the, the stars didn't quite align, and and because of his age, because of his raw mental, raw nature of not really having the greatest experience and none at this level, it just didn't work out for him on the night, unfortunately. Now discussing what does and does not work out from the night, from the outset, Krasidar really up against it, backs against the wall with the selection issues. And Richard, considering the huge raft of players that Krasidar are missing and, and the sheer star quality of Chelsea's side, 
they were out pretty much the game was largely lost from the outset, wouldn't you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it would have been hard enough for Krasnodar to, to win that game against Chelsea, even with a full strength side, because when you only have to look at the quality Chelsea uh, possess, you know, in attack, you know, they can bring a player like Ziyech into the side who, you know, I thought, you know, based on what I saw the highlights of the game, looked like he was really influential, score, go on the score sheet. You know, when they can bring a player like that into their team and then they've already got a, you know, a, a, an array of top talent, especially in attack. You know, it was always going to be difficult. I think for Krasnodar to have any chance there, they would have had to have had a full assortment of players um, and, you know, a full assortment of players available and fit and also for Chelsea probably to have a slight off night. Um, but yeah, I think I think with regards to Lokomotiv and um, Krasnodar, it's one of those things, isn't it? They're playing against top quality opponents. I mean, it was always going to be tough this week. Um, you know, when you could swap, you know, you could swap Lokomotiv and Krasnodar for, let's say, Benfica and Porto. If you played them against Bayern and Chelsea, there's no guarantee those two sides get the win either. It was always going to be a tough week. And um, yeah, I, I don't think a win was was realistic, especially with all the problems Krasnodar had. They had a full strength side. Out, they might have had a, a, a better chance of scraping a point, maybe if Chelsea were off form getting a win. But yeah, it's, it was unrealistic, I think, given the circumstances of their squad and given the quality at Chelsea's disposal. Um, but I mean, encouragingly for them, Sevilla beat, um, encouraging for Krasnodar, Sevilla beat Ren 1-0 in the other game. And I looked at the stats and I think Sevilla had something like 22 shots to Ren's two. So, you know, it was a, as one-sided a 1-0 win as you could get. So thankfully, Ren don't look too good. And hopefully, um, for Krasnodar's sake, Chelsea can beat them in the next two games. And, you know, hopefully, Krasnodar can have as many of their first-team players back as possible, preferably the three main attacking midfielders, Vanderson, Cabella and um, Klaassen for that game against Wren at home. And I have a feeling they could win that game at home and take third ahead of Wren in that group. And I think that will be a success for them on their debut Champions League season because getting ahead of Sevilla and, um, Sevilla and Chelsea, it's, I think it's too much to ask, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would be nice for Cross the Dot to get through the, the, the next stage of the European competition after Christmas, whether it be in the Champions League or more than more likely, of course, the Europa League. But that's... And of course, every footballer wants to win every match that they're in. That's the winning mentality that they have. But it's not really Krasnodar's goal this season, and especially with the group that they do have. It, it was always just about getting into this group stage for the first time and, and getting the money that comes from it and the experience that comes from it and, and building upon that and having that as a framework to do so. Just like Lokomotiv did three years ago, they... It, it wasn't, of course, the first time Loco have ever been in this stage like Krasnodar is, but it was the first time that that group, that core group of players that have largely stayed together now, have pl- had played at that level. And you're seeing incrementally, year in, year out, that they, their performances are getting better, certainly. Last year was some real good efforts of performances, but they lost just about every single game. Now they've already got a point on the board. They've already got a very good, good result. Now, hopefully for Krasnodar, that'll be the same next season. But one thing I will like to mention as the last word on Krasnodar is that when they qualified for the group stages, we all mentioned that we, we hoped that Masayev and Galitsky would go out and strengthen central defence, and they didn't. Now, Kayo is a solid player. I need to preface that. He is, especially in the RPL domestically, he's often very strong. It's very good in, in Krasnodar's system at playing the ball out from the back, and he, he did have a decent game overall. But for me, he's too impetuous and rash at, at, at times. And once again, he got himself in hot water for what was a clumsy challenge that was just a little bit needless, uh, if close to being a very good tackle. But once again, he was on the wrong end of that fine line. Now, David, can Krasnodar cope with the threat in Chelsea, of Chelsea and Sevilla going forward? Or, and what do you think about Kyle's mistake? Um. Can they can they cope with Chelsea and Sevilla? You know, considering the players they were missing, they, they did a good job, and you'd hope that uh, you know come come the latter games, uh, some of those some of those players, you know, Vanderson was was in training but obviously not fit. Cabela's quarantine, Klaassen out with a hopefully short term muscle injury, but we don't really know too much about that. Um, so yeah, you'd hope that they they've got enough to compete. You know, on the night uh, Chelsea were as underwhelming as we sort of thought. And I think we all believed that 4-0 was a flattering scoreline uh, considering, you know, two goals were handed to them by mistakes and one was handed to them by a penalty and sort of 
you know, the goals that did come after the penalty was just sort of, you know, Krasnodar, you know, had, had to try something and it just exposed them, uh, you know, without the penalty. I don't think those two last goals happened. It probably uh, would go in at, at 1-0. Um, as for Kayo, I, I, you know, the, the, the foul didn't ultimately make any difference on the game because obviously they missed the penalty and you know, other goals did go in. Uh, it, it was a very tight call and he, he did have a good game. Uh, we know he can obviously make mistakes. You know, the, the Ren game last week, it was him who had, who had a bad touch and let, let Ren get away and then Sorokin uh, fouled for the penalty. Um, and and yeah, we, we all knew, you know, it was I was baffled when, when they let Spajic go in the summer on loan to, to Feyenoord uh, or whoever, or PSV, one of the Dutch teams. It, it, it was a strange decision because he'd been their best defender the previous season. Uh, so I don't know whether Spike forced it or whether whether you know they they just decided to let him go. Obviously, Krasnodar had to ditch some foreigners because of the foreign limit that came, that came in. You know, they they had like ten or eleven foreign players in the squad, and now they had to suddenly reduce to eight. Granted, they can play more on the pitch, but it, it did limit them. Um, and then when they finally did qualify for the Champions League, um, you know, ideally they for my you know, for our money we, they would have gone out and bought another centre half, but. They they could only buy Russian and really who who would you buy as a Russian? Uh, you know, granted one of their centre halves is is homegrown, but he's Belarusian, not even Russian. So um, you know, it, it's definitely the weak point in their in their squad. But um, there's not much they can do about it unless you know they have to sell some of their foreign players or hope that the limit changes again. And I can't see it changing next year. I think they'll give it at least another year, unfortunately, before we see any change to it again. Um, so they're going to have to try and adapt, uh, and they're going to probably have to clear out some of the, the foreign players in the midfield who who just aren't at the level, so they can try and improve on the defence. Which, uh, although good for most stages, is maybe not good enough for, for the Champions League. And if that's their ambition, they need to try and improve it. Yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. And on on Caio, I think sometimes I am. Perhaps a little bit harsh on him because I can see there's such a player in there, and if he'd learn, he needs to learn from these mistakes because it is the same mistakes over and over again where he's just rash and he's clumsy and he's he's flying in on things that he doesn't need to fly in on. If he just waited, just uh, waited and stood off and stood his ground there, and he would have been so much better off with the amount of bodies that were back, the amount of the amount of men that they had, the space that the that they had the, to play into was just. It's just disappointing to see again that he, he hasn't learned from his mistakes, in spite of me re- really thinking that there is a player in there that if he if he does just get this one clanger out of his game, it could be, be develop into a very very strong defender. Now to move on from Krasnodar straight after the Krasnodar game, Zenit took on Borussia Dortmund in northwestern Germany. Sergei Samak named a largely similar squad to the one that of Rubin game at the weekend in which he experimented with a 4-1-4-1 formation and again deployed that, this time with Barrios sitting just behind Wendell and Kuzyayev, while Yurokin and Seba Drusi lined out wide and Zuba was up top on his own. Now, Zunid started again on the back foot, and there is a trend here, as all three clubs did, and they looked to soak up pressure and counter. They did so for the majority of the first half very efficiently, and this did start to tire a little bit towards the end when when Dortmund started getting a few chances here or there and Sancho started to, started to turn the screw, uh, most notably Marco Royce nearly scored, but they went in the half-time level. And just before that, actually, it was Seba Drelusi who arguably had Zenit's best chance of the game when he latched onto a deep cross from the left and headed narrowly over under pressure from uh, Manuel Akanji. And in fact, it was probably one of the best chances from either side as Dortmund themselves struggled to break down a packed defence. Now, in the second half, this trend continued, but as the game as the game wore on, legs did tire, and Zenit were just pinned further and further back. Lucien Favre introduced Torgan Hazard into the game, and just minutes later, he made an almost instant impact. Vyacheslav Karavayev bundled him down in the box with what was pretty much a rugby tackle, as the Belgian went in for a header. It was a truly needless challenge. Now, Hazard's the smallest player on the pitch, and I don't think I've ever seen him head a ball in his life. Thus, a penalty was given, it was Stonewall, and Dejan Lovren's fury at Karavayev was there for all to see as the camera comically zoomed in on the pair, just to see Lovren staring him down wide-eyed. Jaden Sancho duly dispatched it for his first goal of 2020, and from there on, the game was always being chased by Zenit. They pushed forward late on and tried to make a go of it, 
but was stung on the counter late as Har- Haaland finally found his way out of Lovren's pocket and curled a shot far into the corner one-on-one with Kershikov. Richard, Wendell played the full 90 in midfield, and I was really impressed by his play once again. How do you think he fared? Yeah, I was really impressed with the way he played all game. Um, I think he was probably, arguably, might have been Zenit's best player from what I saw of it. Um, I saw all the first half, had stream problems in the second half, only got bits and bobs of the game. Um, but yeah, for what I saw, um, bits and bobs of the second half, sorry. What I saw, I was really impressed with Wendell. I think um, he's made an impression on us so far when we've seen him. He's he's not an abs- he's not um, what you'd call a cast iron playmaker player in midfield, but he adds some energy and tempo to the midfield. He, he can do a bit of everything. He, I think he, he could develop into a good box to box player for Zenit. I think he could chip in with a few goals for him in the future. Um, gets through work defensively, and um, you know he's got a good touch. And although he's not a, an out and out creator, he can he can pass the ball and gives the midfield a bit more creativity. So yeah, I, I've quite I'm, I'm I've encouraged by I've been encouraged by his start so far, and um, hopefully now I think with his recent performances, I think he's he's pretty much shown that he needs to be playing every week now, every week in the first team if possible. Um, you know, as a first team regular now, and I thought the way Zenit set up was quite was was understandable, and in the first half it worked quite well. I thought for for large swathes of that first half they contained Dortmund's attack really well. Um, and, you know, Wendell alongside Barrios in midfield, you know, I thought both really impressed. And, you know, Lovren had a really good game, I thought, as well in, in defence. I just was so frustrated when I saw that Caravaggio thing because, you know, all the defence and the midfield has done so much hard work. They've kept Dortmund at bay and then you do something like that and the whole thing just changes. And frustrating, really frustrating because, you know, had they been able to hang on for just 10 minutes more, get out of that game with a point, that had gone into the game against Lazio next week at home in a much better frame of mind. Um, but Wendell was the big positive for me, and um, hopefully he can be a further, um, become a key player in this squad going forward, because I've been very impressed with what I've seen. And um, yeah, he should be starting pretty much nearly all the time now, in my opinion. Um, and yeah, it might mean free in midfield is, is going to stay for Zenit to keep him in there. So yeah, some encouraging signs there, I thought, from uh, Wendell. I've been very impressed with him so far. Yeah, certainly a three midfield really makes Zenit look a bit more of a, a complete and just more secure unit. And, and Wendell's really came in like a duck to water at Zenit and is, is starting his life very strongly. Now, to to move on slightly, it's Zenit's biggest threats have really been from centre-back in these two games. Of course, Lovren's had a, had that 30-odd pile driver against Bruja, which cannoned off the post, hit the keeper in the back of the head and bounced in and then Again, last night, uh, the best chance in the second half was a, was an, another real long shot from Yaroslav Lakitsky. It was probably from even further out as well, about 40 yards out, which dribbled just far past the post. Now, David, are you a little bit worried about Zenit's attack in Europe, or is this just down to missing, of course, the two vital players in Malcolm and Sardar Asmoon? Well, yeah, it's not ideal, is it? You know, having... Uh... Having your two best chances and obviously the goal in the first game come from pot shots from your, your centre halves. I, I remember in the Bruges game there was a another great chance uh, from Drusy in that one, another header which I believe I think it was Drusy anyway. It was it like, it was a near post header which he put over. Um, I'm sure of it. So yeah, it's not ideal. You know, I I didn't watch the game and I I remember checking in on it. In the second half, and Zing Zuber had gone off at half time, and, and the stats, you know, the stats were not good. Um, and you wondered how how it would work up there because obviously Zuber is part of that three pronged attack with Asmoon and, and Malcolm. Granted, Malcolm's not been in the best of form, but we know he's got the class and that extra bit of pace that no one else in the Zenit squad's really got, and that ability on the ball that no one else has really got in the squad to, to hit on the counter and if that's what they were trying to do then he would have been perfect as would as moon because obviously Zuber is the is the pivot man for that counter attack uh, and as moon and, and Malcolm are the guys who do the running um so I can see probably why they why they took Zuber off um but it just seems to be just just um just more underperforming from Zenit you know we know they can we can put those performances in uh, granted, you know Dortmund are, are a very good side, and obviously they were doing well enough just to try and hold them out. Maybe that, maybe I don't know if that was the game plan, just to try and potentially just go for the draw, and if they can snatch something, they can snatch something. Uh, not ideal when your defender gives away a, a dodgy penalty, 
uh, or an unnecessary penalty. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's worrying. It is worrying. You know, you'd have at the start of the campaign, you said, right, there's only need to grab six points against Bruges and try and do what they can against the rest. Mm-hmm. Um, they've already lost against Bruges and they've lost their first of the four games against the rest. So um, not a promising start. And we'll see with uh, Bruges picking up a point as well in the other game. They've got four points to game in, to gain in four matches and hope that Bruges don't you know, do anything um, to try and not come last in the group again. So it's going to be a tricky four games here. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And Zenit's game plan very much was let's shut up shop. Let's make it as difficult as possible for Dortmund. And and I mean, Lovren was brilliant. Rakitsky was brilliant. Douglas Santos made such a massive improvement at left back over Krugervoy. And if it wasn't for that one moment of madness from Karavayev, they were so close because the second goal was just Zenit pushing on, knowing that they couldn't lose two at the start getting caught on the hop by Ireland. So the game plan did work for the large part, apart from those few big mistakes. The question is, is should Zenit be performing this way against Dortmund? Zenit are, of course, Russia's biggest club right now, probably the best club, certainly the biggest name, certainly the most money, certainly the most equipped to do well in Europe. The squad is built around getting the best as possible in Europe. They even have a second team which plays on Saturdays. To, to, to offset that that travel and the, the UCL game this week. So, Richard, do you think Semak got his tactics right? Should Zenit maybe have tried to push up more, especially in the second half? Um, I can understand what he was trying to do. Um, we've got to remember Dortmund are a very good side. Um, you know, last season in the Bundesliga, you know, they were up against the best buying team in a long time. You know, it's a difficult one, I guess. If he'd have, if he'd have tried to, um, if he'd have tried to, you know, open up a bit too much, who knows? They could have been two 0 down after twenty five minutes, thirty minutes, and then you, you know, you then then you're behind the eight ball, and you know, you're two 0 down early doors against Dortmund away from home. Your chances of getting back into it are slim unless you, you know, one of the biggest clubs in Europe. Um, I'm still more caught up about last week, to be honest. I thought last week was the time to be on the front foot right from the start. I could understand the more cautious approach against the side like Dortmund. Um, but last week was the one really which which got me. You know, he should have been far too tepid in that first half. Should have really got into Bruges. You know, there's a Bruges side missing, you know, first team players. You know, Zenit should have been more positive from the outset last week. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know about the, the approach being wrong. I, I can sort of understand why people are a bit frustrated with it, but that attack of Dortmund is really, really good. And, you know, had they got, had they been a bit more open, they might have been carved open early doors. So I understand the approach from Zenit um, from the start of that game, um, even though it's, you know, it's, it's, it's frustrating for people to say, I do understand the approach. Yeah. And I think the game was pretty much, gone for Zenit at the end when you see that obviously Zuba went off and and then the, the the attacking force that Zenit had against Dortmund away was Alexis Sutom and Yuri Zhirkov, Alexander Yorokin and Andre Mostovoy, which is the goal from quality there is just unbelievable and and I think losing Zuba at half time and Asmoon and Malcolm before the match really did it for any chances that can they had of getting anything from it, and it's really all on all on Zenit now to try and salvage what they can from the rest of the group games. But if we move back to the RPL matters now, so to finish off, we had another weekend of RPL action. So we'll have just a few quick kicks on some of the games, and just a quick little little roundup. And I'll start off with the Spartak game, who who of course played Krasnodar away, and and Spartak once again took full advantage of their relatively free schedule compared to the, the everyone else in Europe and in playing Krasadar away who had a very, very weak team with with the young young lads starting all over the pitch and fourteen players missing through COVID or injury or suspension and so on. And really Spartak could just were, it was an even game, but they, they were just so clinical in front of goal and that partnership of, of Larson and Ezekiel Ponce is really, really clicking right now with with Ponce sort of the more clinical of Fox in the Box, Porcher getting on the end of stuff and, and Larson coming deep and playing as a second striker at times and really just running defences ragged. 
But of course, uh, once again, with Krasnodar right now, every time you mention them, you have to mention those those huge issues that they have and in the squad right now. And it just totally changed the results in all three of the last games. And Dave, uh, Richard, you, you, um, sorry, David, you, you caught uh, Siska's game. The, the beat Arsenal Tula 5-1, of course, the, the weekend on Monday night. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they were really good. You know, it, it was a classic, classic Cisco performance. You, if you, if you just think of Cisco at their best in the past few years, they, they were really on it. Uh, especially in the second half, you know, they, they scored towards the end of the first half. Penalty um, was a bit controversial. There, were, there was contact, but it was completely accidental. Um, but that goal just gave them the buffer in the second half, and and they really, uh, really enjoyed their football. You could tell in the second half, uh, went away and, sc- and scored some nice goals. Chalov got his first of the season. Sigurdsson got his first of the season. It was just, a, it was just a good all round performance, and it gave it gave me hope going into the. Um, the uh, the Europa League game tonight and which has just finished uh, nil nil disappointing nil nil especially as uh, Wolfsburg in the other game beat final four uh, one you know Siska played they played very well again tonight but uh, for the for the most part um, they, they dominated they had so many shots that just couldn't put any of them in the net uh, you know they've taken a lot of snapshots uh, overplaying and underplaying in the wrong points. Um, so yeah, that's definitely two points lost there because the game was definitely there for the taking tonight. As Dino Zagreb did, did not offer much, and uh, they, they couldn't carry their five-one win over to, to tonight. They obviously arguably scored too many goals Monday and didn't save any for tonight. Yeah, that's a thoroughly d- disappointing result, especially considering just how dominant Siska had been for the majority of this game against uh, Dino Zagreb. And Chidera Juke again today is is almost like Siska in microcosm where. He's so, so intelligent with the ball in some of his runs and, and direct and efficacious and effective. And and then he gets to the final third and his shots just, it's a path, back pass or it's miles over or or he just runs into the player. He's so good up until that final third. And that's exactly what Cisco were today. They, they slaughtered Dino Zagreb all over the pitch and then just couldn't get that goal. To move across Moscow at, at the weekend, uh, Dinamo, Moscow played their first game under the new manager Sandro Schwartz and Richard you kept an eye on the on the events in that game gotta say that was um yeah it was um such an impressive debut we I was actually shocked when you know after we finished recording the pod last Thursday you know news broke of him actually arriving we we didn't we hadn't heard of that before the pod and then he actually had arrived in Moscow um that day uh late Thursday evening so going into that game against um Sochi on Saturday he basically had a, he, he'd only had one training session with the team on the Friday but uh, wow, that was a really impressive um, performance by Dinamo. Um, I thought, you know, that was from an attacking point of view, the best performance all season in attack, you know. And I like the way Schwartz set the team up. It was um, a 4-3-2-1 formation. And um, and yeah, it was a midfield three of uh, Charles Cabore, Daniel Fomin and uh, Sebastian Szymanski. And um, behind... Clinton and G and uh, Daniel Lezavoy, the two, and then uh, Nikolai Komachenko up front. It's like a Christmas tree formation, and yeah, it was it was much better, uh, much crisper in attack. Um, not as much long balls that we saw under Kirill Novikov. The odd direct pass to Komachenko, but much more emphasis on quicker transitional phase, short, that's quicker transitional play. Sorry, shorter passing. And um, I thought Sebastian Szymanski was excellent. That that was his best game in a Dinamo Moscow shirt. I mean, this season we've seen a progress from him compared to last season. Again, last season he was just 20 when he signed from Legia Warsaw. He was just getting used to, you know, playing in a new league and everything like that. But this season he's improved. And I thought that could be the performance against Sochi that, you know, really likes the touch paper, you know. And hopefully now he'll go on and have a really... Um, good progressive uh, couple of months and um, the reports actually linking him in the press of a move to Italy and Spain just recently um, in the Polish press so this is his this is his um, audition let's just say under a new manager um, and yeah I really like that formation that they were they were, they were in because uh, although Clinton G went off injured um, Vyacheslav Gryov came on to replace him and um, the good thing about playing Lezavoy in that two-man um, attacking midfield behind the striker is he can also peel wide owing to his past as a winger and fire crossing the box and then because you've got 
Gui off there alongside Komlachenko that you can get two players in the box and Samansky in a box to box role rushing to get into the box as well. So, um, and you know, there's still Nicola Morrow to come back into that team as the new right back. Um, Guillermo Varela, who was signed from um, Copenhagen, uh, the Uruguayan right back. So, there's still some players to come into that Dinamo side, Roman Yevgenyev. And to win 3 1 against Sochi, yeah, I was very impressed. And um, they can back that result up, up now against Tambov. That's always been the thing with Dinamo inconsistency. But, you know, Schwartz will have had a full week to work with them now. And um, fingers crossed they can back that result up on Saturday against uh, Tambov and um, get another three points. But it was a very encouraging start from Sandro Schwartz. Mm. I was impressed with what I saw in, a, in, a, in attack from them. Yeah, certainly. It's, it's maybe a little bit early to, to put too much on us on Schwartz, but but it certainly helps that he just released those shackles that Novikov had and, and playing them so deep. And it's the least isolated. I've definitely seen Komlachenko all season. So definitely some positive football for Dinamo should get the hopefully get the best out of what is a very good group of players. Now, moving on to what is not necessarily the best group of players in the league, it's Rota Volgograd, who up until this weekend, were, were winless and hadn't actually won in the RPL in 16 years, but they pulled off a shock result over Lokomotiv, and, and again, like Spartak, taking advantage of this this long run of fixtures that these European teams are having to play in. And to be fair to Rotter, they were good for the win. They really, really played well, and Cedric Agua was he went off it after an hour, but for the majority of the game, he absolutely dominated the middle of the park. He's playing in central midfield for further forwards and he usually plays a centre back and, and that was a real, real good decision from uh, Katskevich to play him there. And then of course up top, Flamarion Jr. got a goal and assist. Granted his goal was a penalty, but he made it and he won it. And it was a great assist for Andreas Ponce, who scored with I think about two or three touches after coming on in general. And uh, that that sign those signings of Ponce and and uh, Flamarion have been I have added a little bit of bite to Rotter's attack that they've previously just completely missed this season. And Flamarian in general, I think, is he's not too striking. He's not too really caught the eye, but he's just been very clinical. He's only had... He's scored 50% of his shots on target for Rotter already. And he's he's got two goals and one assist in four games. So, very good start for him. And hopefully things are looking up down in Volgograd. And to move on from one surprise result, it was another surprise result, David, as, as your boys Rubin defeated Zenit. What do you mean, surprise? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, uh, we we just uh, we took advantage of of Zenit missing missing the players they were doing and resting a couple of players ahead of their Champions League game and um, and yeah, put on put on a decent display. Um, you know, we we uh, conceded first uh, off a free kick, but uh, went up the other end and, and scored a nice goal from Despot. Um, and then, and then Darko Jevtic, who you know, I'll, I'll be one of the ones to admit I, I've, I've been in the group who have been much maligning him. Uh, a lot of the Ruben fans and, and the press around Kazan have sort of you know questioned his signing and uh, you know, argued you know what, what's he add to the team. But um, you know he, he popped up with his first goal for for the club in in a big match and it was a, it was a belter. Um, and it was a game where creature was kept quieter than normal. You know, both the goals actually came down the right through a sort of Bukayev instead. Um, and while creature had still a decent number of dribbles in the game, he, he was kept quieter. Um, but solid performance all round. And uh, that was with a couple of our key players missing as well through uh, suspended Makarov and uh, Abelgar both were suspended for that one. So uh, yeah, good win. And, you know, it, it's, it's made, made that, made that race for the top uh, a bit more interesting. You know, it's, from, from Ruben in ninth, West, I was like, we got three points there, and I looked at the table, and we hadn't even moved position, still stuck in ninth um, on eighteen points, but three points would take us up to fourth ahead of Lokomotiv. So um, it's very tight there in the in those spaces from from fourth down to tenth, where Ahmed are on seventeen. You know, five points separating separating seven teams there. So um, you know, every win's vital, and a, a win against any is 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 great for us. I'm hoping we can uh, grab another one this weekend against Arsenal Tula. Yeah, and Slutsky just quietly going about his job there, and, and once again just doing a very a very efficient one with with Rubin. And that means we've come to the end of this week's RFN podcast. Uh, next week on the site, we've got some coverage of the European games as per a roundup of the RPL fixtures and then a preview, uh, a podcast, sorry, previewing Lokomotiv versus Atletico Madrid. As always, keep up with the RFN on Twitter 
Uh, that's at Russ Football News, where Hanu has been doing a stellar job of covering everything from the UCL to the RPL and everything else in between. Um, David, where can everyone find yourself online? And would you like to give a little mention to your piece on Kavisha that went up on the site last week? Yeah, um, you can find me on Twitter at RFN underscore David. Um, yeah, I finally decided to write about about Kavisha. It's been long, long in the works, and uh, you know I, I did all did all my research. Well, I've been doing all my research for the last year since I've been watching him, but you know there's some good vis- visuals in there based off uh, the instat figures. You know, see so you can compare me against the other RPO players, and you know uh, he's just a big one for the future uh, this week. Obviously, I don't know if you've seen you've first seen this, but um, Nobel Arostamian, you know the Russian journalist, put out a big hour and a half uh, documentary on his YouTube channel all about Kvitsha, and you know he was earning high praise from from some big people inside Russian and Georgian sport, you know, Slutsky, uh, Yuri Syomin, a lot of uh, fellow Georgian internationals, fellow Russian internationals. So, um, you know, he's getting a lot of hype right now and arguably uh, has, has done it, is well-deserving of it. Yeah, certainly, certainly. He's playing very well. And if only you could find an end product there. No, but, uh, Richard, where can everybody find you online? And- <laughs> And you also appeared on some um, Polish and English football sites this week discussing all things Russian football. Yeah, you can find me at um, at richdpike89, at richdpike89. And yeah, a Polish journalist got in touch with me and uh, wanted to ask me about um, Lokomotiv and the situation. Um, he was writing for the website footballnews.pl, footballnews.pl. And, uh, yeah, it was about a general chat about Lokomotiv for the two Polish players that they've got playing for them, obviously, uh, Gregorz Kikowiak and um, Mateusz Rybus, and um, what the situation is with them at Lokomotiv, what, what's Lokomotiv's expectations this year. And there might be a piece, um, I mentioned a bit about Sebastian Szymanski at Dynamo as well, so um, under the new management of Sandro Schwartz, so there might be another bit coming out on that. Um, yeah, the, the, the piece about... The piece about um, about um, local and their two Polish footballers is already out. So it's uh, footballnews.pl, footballnews.pl, that that piece appeared on. And then, yeah, I also appeared on SW6, um, just wrote a little piece about what to expect from Krasnodar um, in, before the game against Chelsea in the Champions League. You know, very nice. I uh, enjoyed it. It was good. That's been the RFN podcast. Goodbye for now. <laughs> Идет футбольный матч, летит над полем мяч. Веди его, беги, точнее его удар. Но мяч берет ноги решительный фронтар. Не напрасно футбольное поле самых ловких и смелых плечо. Здесь нужны тренировка и воля, быстрота, увлечение, расчет.